Welcome to the Fire These Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century from the periphery. I'm your host, Jure Ayub, and my goal is to use this platform to connect with activists, scholars, writers, and other weird folks from around the world to link our stories and interests up. Join me as we get into all sorts of futurisms, from solar punk to degrowth, as we explore meaningful ways of creating links between the peoples on the periphery, and as we explore various topics from tech to anti-authoritarian politics, feminism, abolitionism, decolonialism, anti-racism, and all the other fun-isms in between. This podcast is ad-free and accessible to everyone thanks to the generous donations of Patreon supporters on patreon.com slash fire these times. For as little as $5 a month or 50 a year, you can help keep this podcast independent that way. If you're a student, unemployed, or in any kind of financial difficulties, you can support with $2 a month or 20 a year. There are also other methods such as on PayPal or buymeacoffee.com, and you can find the relevant links in the description below or on the website. My goal is to make this project financially sustainable so that I can work on producing valuable content on a regular basis such as this podcast, the newsletter, my essays, various online resources, and hopefully eventually YouTube essays as well. And if you like the content of this podcast, you can also check out the newsletter. In that newsletter, which I release on a quasi-monthly basis, I reflect on some of the topics discussed on this podcast and try to take them a bit further. The newsletter is free and you can get it by simply subscribing directly on the website. The Fire These Times is named after the James Baldwin book The Fire Next Time and the music is by Ibrahim Youssef. Thank you for listening and take care. Hey everyone, so this is a conversation with Cindy Milstein, the editor of the book There is Nothing So Whole as a Broken Heart, Mending the World as Jewish Anarchists. I wanted to have Cindy on to talk about what I feel was a diaspora to diaspora conversation. So in this conversation, I kind of made it a point not to bring up either Israel or Zionism. We do make references to states and we make references to nationalism and anti-nationalism. But I wanted this to be a conversation that at least goes against the tendency of always expecting a conversation between radicals that involve a Jewish person to be about Israel and or Zionism. I actually think this is a very toxic tendency and I wanted to avoid that. That being said, uh, we spoke about displacement as part of the Jewish experience. We spoke about having communities and the importance of communities without states and beyond states. I uh, talked a bit about my own background as someone who studies the politics of language, specifically Hebrew and Yiddish. We also spoke about Ladino and all of those things that if you don't know about, well, this would be a good episode to become familiar with. Uh, We got into authoritarianism and the tendency within authoritarianism to flatten all differences and diversity. Uh, Cindy obviously spoke about Jewish anarchism and specifically queer Jewish anarchism and As with every episode, we also kind of went all over the place. We spoke about hegemonic narratives in Europe. I gave examples of the Dreyfus Affair, of Alsace, of Berlin, of Spain. And finally, we also had a conversation about anti-Semitism on the right and, of course, on the left as well. So, as you might guess, this is a pretty broad conversation. I really think you will find this one interesting. And as always, I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Send me your reviews, your comments, your critiques, all of that stuff, either on Patreon or by email, which you can find on the website. Uh, thank you for listening, folks, and take care. I'm, uh, my name is Cindy Milstein, and um, uh, I am a, I don't know, queer Jewish anarchist human being <laughs> um, and I I write and organize and um, like a lot of people are de- coping with like the collective trauma of this moment. Um, we'll, we'll primarily be kind of focusing on, on a book that you edited and, and contributed to as well which is called uh, There's Nothing So Whole as a Broken Heart, Mending the World as Jewish Anarchists uh, which came out last year I believe. And it's a fantastic book with like dozens of uh, different contribution essays and other kinds of formats as well. Can you kind of start, start us off with talking a bit about it? Like what is sort of its background? Why, how did it come into being and so on? Yeah, sure. And first, of all, I want to also really thank you for this conversation. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, yeah, um, I, I love, I've realized I love um, curating and editing anthologies from um, concept to finish. And because I feel like they're these beautiful containers for bringing together multiple voices in mm. conversation with each other. And I, so I try really hard to do that. I have like s- sort of strong themes I want to bring out, but I, I I'll really like voices that aren't all in agreement around those themes. So in the case of this one, it came from back in the, 
the days before the pandemic, um, I tend to um, go to a lot of different places. I was, I hope I can again, go to a lot of different places to do um, different talks with other books I've done or um, just hold, sp- hold space for all sorts of conversations. And um, I was noticing that, wow, a lot of places I went, <laughs> there were suddenly I seemed to be staying with um, not just anarchists, but, um, but Jewish anarchists. And I was just experiencing firsthand this incredible resurgence of Jewish anarchism, which has had a long um, and wonderful um, tradition within anarchism. But it was noticeably different in the sense that it spoke to me in a way that it hadn't before, because it was also very feminist and queer and trans and trying to kind of do something different with Jewish anarchism than it had done in the past. So I was like, oh, this is curious. And when I get curious about things, and I was really personally and politically enthused about it, um, I decided to do this collection of stories, including because I wanted to read them. <laughs> so yeah, that's how, sort of how it came about. Yeah. And also, I think my own, um, yeah, for me, I guess it really struck me. If I, I organized an anarchist summer school, uh, which had, had, had to be delayed because of the pandemic. But um, the last summer, of it. Um, there was a group of us who happened to be both Jewish and anarchists, and we actually sort of circled up at one point, we're having a conversation. And it really struck me, one of the folks who actually has a piece in the book just said, wow, the pain they experience is they can't be a Jew in anarchist spaces, and they can't be an anarchist in Jewish spaces. And that that was something they wanted to bring the whole of themselves together. And I realized coming in to a lot more contact with the sort of resurgent Jewish anarchism, I really did feel whole. And I watched other people feeling more whole through that. And yeah, so the last thing I want to say is I I just realized during this pandemic time, I've just been so grateful for that space being created. (laughs) There's just an incredible flowering of Jewish anarchistic anarchist (laughs) and anarchistic um, projects and spaces, but that's been held really beautifully through the pandemic precisely to help us all get through it. And as a lot of us have been saying, well, we're kind of used to this. We have a long, long thousands of years history of figuring out how to survive moments like this or try to and how to not just survive, but find life in moments like this. So I I really sort of feel like Jewish anarchism, in a sense, like saved and sustained my life during the pandemic. And I know it's done that for a lot of others and allowed us to honor um, the grief and the death that's happened during this time period. Yeah, I definitely got that feeling while reading the book and there's the emphasis i mean it's in the subtitle of the of the the book as well like mending the words like it's recognizing the existing uh pains and suffering and challenges and struggles obviously but also sort of kind of echoing the fact that we have been through this before if not exactly in the same way of course but there have been moments in which it has really felt like this is the end or this is a I mean, other than literally previous pandemics, of course, like the one of about a century ago, just in terms of like hardships um, that really feel overwhelming. I guess I can put it that I could put it that way. And I, 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 one thing that really attracted me to this book, uh, I'm not Jewish, uh, I'm I'm of uh, like Lebanese, Palestinian origins and other uh, heritages as well. And but I do have this history in my family of displacement and this is something that uh, I can really trace it back roughly to the 1800s because we don't have much documentation before that and it's it's the reason why I have Italian and Argentinian ancestry for example and obviously with the Palestinian after 48 it's also a part of that story and I wanted if it's okay to kind of I wanted to ask I mean if it's okay to kind of talk to us a bit about the role of displacement and how this is sort of an inherent component I don't know if I could put it that way, but, you know, correct me if, it, if it's wrong. But the inherent component of the Jewish experience, uh, broadly speaking, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes, totally. And um, and as you just pointed out, um, your and many other people's experience, um, which is why I think that category of, of displacement or like in the book, I also talk a lot, a lot about um, diaspora, um, which is a form of displacement. Um, yeah, is is so resonant with so many of us. and formative uh i almost think within within you know judaism both like historically and written works and yeah sort of self-identity and culturally on pretty much on every level um this notion of being displaced i I think is inseparable (laughs) you know many of the yeah the store the stories we tell and we talk about or the holidays revolve around that sense of being displaced and, and um yeah, for myself, I always talk about it sort of, I never feel at home in this world. And 
I think that's, that's why I want to change the world or, but in Judaism, there's that, there's this really incredible concept, which we practice each week in a sense on Shabbat. And this is a Shemitah year, which is every seven years, you're supposed to like forgive debts and let the land rest and a whole bunch of other really egalitarian notions of, um, but it's, a, it's a considered the Shabbat of Shabbat every seven years. Mm-hmm. And what, what you're supposed to do during that time is, is experiment with the world to come. Like, what does it mean to step away from capitalism and colonialism and all the other things that don't let us feel whole in this world? And mm-hmm. So, yeah, but part of that is a story. And I, I don't know, there's this really, you know, whether it's, whether it's historically accurate or not, but it speaks to me as a diasporic person. And kind of one of the stories within Judaism, which we t- retell a lot, is, you know, being thrown into um, exile for, you know, and a long time mm-hmm. and being forced to, to wander. Um, but the first thing that happens is, um, you know, whether you, I, I'm not, a, I'm not someone who believes in God, but in the story, you know, you're given this like kind of sacred space. That's a temporary structure that creates a space for community and um, remembering who we are and sharing stories and yeah, feeling the sacredness of, of connection. And we pick that up and move it every time we continue to forward. But that story, even, even in the religious text ends before we ever reach that place of mm. freedom, that place of the world to come. And I don't know that we, you know, we, 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 as an anarchist, we never will reach this, this place. Right. I, I understand that we're always in search of it. So yeah, that, that double edgedness of displacement where it's the most brutal, horrible hardship and trauma, which um, I'm sure you also feel my, I can't trace my family back much farther than you. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea. I, I know from reading histories of Jews that I probably don't even come from where, you know, I don't even know where it comes from. You know, yeah, we yeah. Jews have been displaced so many times. I could come from nowhere and everywhere. Right. Mm. But I think that that transgenerational trauma is carried in, in our bodies, in our culture, in our stories and how we, you know, yeah. Foods we eat, traditional cult strategies of resistance and mourning. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not just a trauma. <laughs> it's also been, a sense, a a powerful, powerful force to, you know, crossing. Yeah. Generate. It's been generative. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't, those, those things are so inseparable from each other, you know? And I think that's the, why the title of the book, there's nothing so whole as a broken heart. It's like, there's a sense of like, we've all been scattered and displaced and broken and pulled apart so many times. And we want to feel the sense of wholeness, but that wholeness in a sense only comes by bringing all those parts of ourselves with us. Right. So mm-hmm. you just named all those different parts of yourself and I'm sure there's many more. And those parts aren't just trauma. Right? <laughs> they, they bring something uniquely beautiful together in you. Right. Yeah. And, and when various ones of us, you know, end up displaced in the same place for a while, we end up creating beautiful, different generative ways of understanding the world. So yeah, it's, it's, it's both the heartbreak and the beauty, I think of displacement. Unfortunately, right now, like, I don't know if I, you know, I'm not good at statistics, but from everything Mm -hmm. I've read, this is a moment of the greatest displacement of the most people in ever in human history Mm -hmm. um, in terms of numbers and um, more people are somewhere they don't want to be. And so the pain of displacement right now is profound. Right? It's like, it's a different thing to choose to move between spaces and another thing to be forced by, you know, capitalist fueled climate catastrophes, economics, violence, gentrification, colonization, you know, we could go on and on. So, yeah. So I don't want to make light and in, as in, is in this anthology or I just, in, in many of us as human beings right now, trying to hold both the grief and the, the generativeness and the beauty of that at the same time is like, yeah, I think that's the task. <laughs> yeah. I, it def- definitely made me think of that quote that you yourself use in the, in the introduction, I think by a, an anarchist, a Greek anarchist kind of yours called Paparuna, I believe, who uh, explained the term diaspora uh, this way. I have it in front of me to disperse most likely from the act of spreading seeds across both space and time it is a scattering apart and also and also a seeding of man places and moments it holds pain loss and separation but hope growth but also grow uh, sorry but also growth and nurturance as well i think i butchered that quote but that's the gist of it yeah it's something that i obviously i think about a lot as i mentioned like from my own history but also my present like just moving so many times in the past few years largely to 
like the official story is to follow an academic route, but in practice it was, yeah, it was just seeking visas and residencies and that sort of thing because, you know, one has to be realistic about these things. I wanted to kind of, in the, also in the introduction of the book, and you did mention it a bit, but if it's okay to sort of expand on that, that you do say that you, you, or you, you do write that you aspire or that this book aspires to speak to all diasporic peoples in hopes that we can remember how much we share. Can you sort of talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one thing I was I, like for me, and I don't know if this speaks to other guys or peoples, but I, I think it, it, yeah, I think it does. I don't want to assume that. Um, but what it shows, like for me within, within um, the Jewish world, um, for thousands of states, sta- for thousands of thousands of years, um, that, most Jews have lived in diaspora and, and still uh, probably the vast majority do. And um, it's a very recent thing that there was any kind of sense of a state um, related to Jews, which I think was a, a wrong turn. Um, but um, what, what that has shown to me is that it's, it's possible to have community without states, without borders across the globe and held together or a community held together in diaspora um, by things that we self determine <laughs> and we we um, voluntarily, you know, both see as our responsibility and something we want to do and something we shift and change and becomes dynamic over time to the different contexts. And I know pretty much, you know, di- diasporic people are, I think all in a sense, many of us share the same thing of like, we, we want to keep, a sense of who we are together, whether that's, you know, foods or culture or language or um, in, in Judaism, there's, which I, I can't speak for other traditions, but um, you know, there's between whether you understand it as Jewish law or Jewish traditions or Jewish rituals, there's many practices for that for thousands of years have kept people bound together again, without need for like a status set of rules right, or um, um, police or all these other structures that, um, you know, control and destroy us. Um, so on the one hand, I think um, that's one way we share that we're all, we all are living examples of it's possible to have a sense of belonging and care and um, mutualistic obligation, et cetera, solidarity without states and borders. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of, I, so, okay. So some background, I did my, my master's um, like the thesis in 2016 in London, and it was on the politics of Yiddish and Hebrew. And it was a, a very, because I, I grew up in Lebanon, right? So not exactly the, the two most old languages <laughs> in Lebanon, but it's it's a very odd, I don't know, a curious turn of events of how that came about. And I don't know if I've ever, ever fully told that story, so just I'll just say it now. Um, I wanted to do something related to Lebanon. Uh, language in Lebanon was sort of what I was going for, uh, and there are there's int- there's an interesting thing to be done about language politics and, and and by language politics I just mean like how how language is perceived, you know how it's conceptualized, the, the role of uh, Arabic in Lebanon, for example, you know that sort of thing. But I also needed I had just left uh, to do my studies and I, I needed some. Uh, separation or some some distance from from Lebanon for some time, and I was in this library I saw us at University of London, and they have a, a sizable collection of I don't remember what they called it, but probably like Jewish studies and and yeah I think that's what they called it. I, so yeah I was you know flickering through some of the books and I and I, I found one of the what would end up being one of the many books that I ended up using in the thesis, which was on this his, history of Yiddish. Um, and that immediately clicked with me. I have no, as far as I know, I have no direct familial connection. Um, but there was something in that story that really uh, spoke to me. And it's it's that, it's the story of being kind of, yeah, spread around, um, well, Eastern Europe primarily, but also Central Europe. And having something that that connects peoples that are otherwise very different, which is this language. And I'm kind of simplifying, obviously, but this was one thing. And it, it ended up becoming, because I, ne- I needed to justify uh, how about, <laughs> like, writing a thesis, it ended up becoming a comparative thing between the history of Yiddish and the history of Hebrew with a focus on the 20th century. And obviously the politics of 
you might we might say like nationalism versus quote unquote diasporism is a term that I saw uh, used. And it's in, in that context that I, I came across the term doikite, uh, which is, uh, for those who don't know, like hereness, as in here, h e r e ness. Uh, I, I think that's one of the one of the translations. That's probably a better one. But and there was this poster which I ended up printing and having above me when I was writing um, my PhD. Actually, the first couple of years when I was in Scotland, which is which says in Yiddish, and this is the English translation: "Wherever we all live, that is our homeland." And so, oh yeah, I have more thoughts on this, but I was wondering if you can kind of give us some sense uh, from from the book, because I don't know if it's in your own personal family history, so if it is, feel free to mention that. But I know that in the book, there, there was quite a lot of talk of like, you know, Yiddish and Ladino, this other uh, Jewish language. Um, and the, sort of the, the their importance as being more than just languages, as having this actual symbolic i guess i don't know but a sort of weight behind them if that makes sense yeah totally does yeah what a a, a great thing you wrote on it <laughs> yeah no the politics of i mean the politics of language is like you know clearly i mean right at this moment when there's been a lot of um resurgence of questioning uh white supremacy and i would actually say white christian often male supremacy um and mm-hmm. how that the history of that has um stolen dispossessed and displaced um so many peoples and that includes their languages right and there's so there's a lot of emphasis um not just among um jews but others of um or you know jewish radicals that's the circles i'm in um of you know understanding that like it's it one of the weapons of (laughs) um unassimilating and uh you know decolonizing and um, um you know Defying a lot of the things that have um, tried to destroy us is is languages to relearn languages and re and languages shape how we see the world right and how we understand and um you know um so I mean Yiddish for example uh, I don't you know I unfortunately do not speak it my father did and tried started trying to teach me when I was young but uh, the trauma of my um my grandmother's trauma led her to use Yiddish to just scream at him constantly from when he was a young child <laughs> till mm-hmm. she died. And so for me, that was a language of them screaming at each other. Um, but I, now I really wish I had, <laughs> but uh, what I appreciate about Yiddish, whether it's translated into sort of um, the culture that I grew up in and others um, is that for instance, the language includes a lot of sort of joking at her own sort of expense or at our at our troubles right <laughs> and so for that's the coping strategy of a lot of diaspora peoples is turn sort of hardship into jokes you know um but yiddish also has like for now i've been really this has really been striking me now during a pandemic when people go hey how are you and everyone's like you know perfunctory responses oh you know good or okay or whatever i mean i'm in in the so-called united states right now so you know this kind of really ridiculous falseness that people have about greetings and but in Yiddish, there's so many ways to basically say, eh, I'm not really doing that well. <laughs> but if you don't know, you know, you don't understand the context, you wouldn't get the kind of humor in it. But I think, you know, there's dozens of ways to say that in Yiddish, right? <laughs> Little subtleties of how you're not doing well. Um, and so I'm thinking like to revive language, you know, to come back to your bigger point, it's like, it's to reclaim meaning, <laughs> to reclaim culture. Um, but it also, you know, is a way to reclaim um when we want to be seen and see each other and when we don't want to be seen. And one of the pieces in the anthology, for instance, talks about someone who um, um, has paint, painted some banners in, in Yiddish and brought them to demonstrations and, and that are anti-fascist. Mm. And um, they talk about how, you know, it allows Jews to read, read them and who they're with as Jewish and join them and meet them. And it allows fascists to understand that they're Jews and that they're dangerous to them and they're there to oppose them. But the fascists in the state and others can't read the Yiddish. So we're sort of legible and not legible at the same time. And right. um, how do you, how do we play with that tension of like, who do we want to be legible to, to for, again, to each other, but not to like, you know, citizenship or passports or all these other things. So I think to come back to this language, you know, the kind of Thai language and diaspora and um, some of this um, together, um, there's so much more we could keep talking about of like the sort of solidarities is like, how did we have codes and understanding and ways? Um, I mean, I'm queer. Queers have done this for a long time. It's like, how do we know who we are, right? And so part of that is these ways we signal to each other 
Um, and diasporic peoples have often had really remarkable similar ways of signaling to each other where they are or who they are or where they can protect each other. Um, you know, whether that's forms of like, um, I touch on this in the book, for instance, like forms of, you know, when you're a diasporic people, how do you, how do you make noise to call each other together again, right? There's remarkably similar ways people have done that or, um, you know, making space feel safe again, et cetera. And language is, is in a sense, a part of that. It's a part of us being able to, um, yeah, be there for each other in a way that, is different. Um, but I think w- within Judaism, especially, but I don't, this is true, you know, in every, I, this was so true. I mean, language, like everything else has become so homogenized, right? <laughs> and there were thousands, thousands, thousands of languages. And so Jews have spoken so many different languages. There are Jews of all different colors and shapes and sizes and regions <laughs> and practices. And, you know, to sort of come back to the beautifulness of diaspora is seeds that are scattered. I mean, seeds, the seeds of Judaism are all different types of varieties, right? And they've, they've blossomed all sorts of different languages and traditions, et cetera. And yet there's still this shared sense of, you know, when you meet another Jew, you still have a shared sense of, ah, oh, you do Shabbat too. I do too. How do you do it? What do you do on that? What do you, you know, what, la- and part of that is what language, what words do you use, right? Or what, 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 you know, what do you say or what do you eat? or what, right? And so how do we do that? I think these spaces where we open up space to understand, hey, we do these things differently, but there's something that's held us together, <laughs> you know, and I don't think that's limited just to some boundary of Judaism, right? You know, like I, I find a lot of recognition in people who understand themselves as also not even, you know, having lost a lot of um, culture and languages when we share, for instance, I will use another example for a lot of a huge percentages of them. Um, diasporic people before they were colonized used calendars that related to the natural world or mark time or maybe not even time and different concepts of how life felt <laughs> maybe it wasn't even linear you know use the sun and the moon and the ecosystem to understand the cycles of life and with their role in it and their relationship to it and their embeddedness to it right and that is goes across pretty much all diasporic cultures and then you have empires and popes and colonizers coming and going, no, we're going to unify and consolidate and impose a calendar upon the world. And that world is the calendar of the time, of, you know, capitalism and colonialism and, um, you know, a dominant religion that wants to crush most of us. And so all of us coming back to our calendars, it's, I, during the pandemic, I was spent a like more and more drawn to the Jewish calendar and how we understand, which always starts at twilight. And so for instance, how you know that the end of Shabbat happens is you can look up to the sky when you first, or other holidays that start at other times that start um, at, at twilight is you look up and when you see the first three stars, you know, it's time to move into the next, you know, and that's such a beautiful different way. But you think about the Jewish New Year, there are actually four, but <laughs> the main Jewish New Year, I started looking into the calendar time of that. And almost all the major sort of diasporic, non sort of hegemonic um, traditions have New Year's at all different times based upon the moon or the sun. That's a profoundly different way of understanding the world, right? a different language, if you want. I would say I want to draw this, uh, just draw this last point out. It's like a different language, right? We, we have a language that makes us much more in, in a part of the natural mm-hmm. world of which we were we, we are part of that world, right? And now humans are so disconnected to it when we have a calendar that makes has no relationship to other cycles, right? And when we look at other cycles, we understand that diaspora isn't, you know, being diasporic isn't some aberration. It's what humans and animals and seeds and plants and um, the moon and the sun and the stars, everything is constantly in motion, <laughs> <laughs> and constantly moving and then comes back again or converges or finds places of overlap. But to stay still is actually counter sort of to who, who we are, you know, humanity where we're, we move to be with each other. We move to, you know, engage with our environments and hopefully live in harmony with them. And, you know, all these other structures that have stolen things from us, including our very voices to be able to like articulate that, you know, have to be, to me, undone. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for that. I, I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of the um, Ladino, um, mm-hmm. which for those who don't know, it's like Judeo-Spanish would be another way of calling it. 
it's the language of um, of those who were expelled in expelled forcibly displaced and ethnic clans in 1492 yeah uh, in what is now Spain and there are still of course speakers of Ladino and I, I would go th- down these rabbit holes on on youtube like wiki tongues and other sort of thing and there are lots of lovely uh like lullabies in ladino for those who want to uh-huh. want to check them out on youtube and i speak spanish so i i understand most of it but i would always be very curious um like when i don't like what are, what are these words that i don't and sometimes they're like hebrew words but sometimes there are words taken from the other languages that those displaced uh, Jewish peoples were, you know, they went to 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 what is now Greece, to to what is now Turkey, uh, other in the, what's now the Balkans as well, all of those places, and to, you know, obviously the language would adapt depending on the context. So there isn't even technically just one Ladino. There's just one main, uh-huh. uh, one dialect that sort of most can understand it. But yeah, it's it's it it has adapted. It has taken from all of these different places, and yet it's still this one thing. It hasn't lost itself in that sense. Uh, it hasn't been I don't know what's the term yet, but it hasn't lost itself in in those other languages. It's it was still its own language, and it still is its own language. And at some point, Ladino was actually one of the lingua franca of the Mediterranean uh, for quite wow. a few, for like two three centuries. Uh, I forgot which centuries exactly, but I would guess 16th and 17th, 17th century would be included in those. And so you did have like merchants, you know, from what is now Turkey going to what is now uh, Greece or elsewhere and speaking to one another in Ladino, even if they were themselves not Jewish. And this is one of those things that I had no idea that Ladino existed in the same way that uh, I had no idea that there was such a thing as Judeo-Arabic, which is more of a family of languages. It's not just one thing with different dialects and so on, which again also reflected like there's something very there's a very specific uh, Judeo-Arabic from Baghdad and a very specific Judeo-Arabic from elsewhere. You know that sort of thing. Uh, those histories, for the most part, of course there is documentation and there are people who you know whose scholarship is around these, but they're not they're no longer part of this mainstream. Um, and I don't know if I should say like global conversation. I guess I, I don't know. It's a bad way of putting it. But one example, also another example I can give is what I was doing this masters. So that when I was doing politics of Yiddish specifically, I came across a number of accounts of people who, when they because there were kind of these debates, although they were never uh, like live or anything like that, but there were lots of different correspondences and in different journals and you know different places of the world saying, you know, we should use Yiddish or saying we should use Hebrew. It's never this explicit, but it's kind of like the the general argument. And one of those who were opposed to Yiddish, and that would have been in their, like, 50s, so it's not even that long ago, post-Holocaust, obviously, described Yiddish, no, 60s, sorry, described Yiddish as uh, the language of the dead and of those in retirement homes or something like that. Some really, really horrible way of putting it. And... That quote, and I can find the, I'm paraphrasing, so it's not 100% accurate, but that kind of stayed with me while I was doing this, because in those debates, and often, as I said, they were pretty heated, um, there were, like, pretty horrible stuff said, uh, the sort of stuff that you wouldn't hear, or you wouldn't think you would hear uh, uh, said, like, from one Jewish person to the other, but it, it was very very heated and aggressive and yeah like very demeaning type of language was used and there are even more horrible things but i'm not gonna i don't want to mention them here and this was just about language this wasn't like no one was debating in those things they weren't really debating you know communism versus capitalism versus (laughs) nationalism that wasn't it was just literally should we speak this language or should we not and in the 40s and 50s you had these these um i forgot what they called them so like these battalions the one of the language was but one of the groups was called a battalion uh, kind of enforcing the language of hebrew because there were so many people who spoke all of these other languages and it's one of those things that one wonders, and I guess this is the question I'll ask you, why do you think, and it's not just about language, but it's just what I'm thinking of now, but what do you think it is about this, like this multiplicity, right? Like multiple languages, multiple ethnicities, multiple uh, origins, uh, what have you, that 
is always under threat. Like there's always a an authoritarian uh, force. And I'm being very vague here, but like a state yeah. or you know a, a a fascist movement or what have you that always seeks to want like almost deeply desire flattening all of those differences or you know that diversity in the name of this one ideal or whatnot and obviously we're you know having this conversation in early 2022 we've been seeing this especially in the past few years develop as well right so yeah I, i'm yeah i'm just wondering about if you have some thoughts so that while i yeah um, i i feel like i spoke a lot <laughs> oh no you didn't know this is great. i'm really appreciative of you um, yeah, I've talked about this book before. No one's really picked up on the language. I, I, re- I really like what I, one reason I like this anthology. It's, I think it's very Jewish in structure where it's like, there's a lot of different parts to it, but yeah. <laughs> I, for, uh, like what, I don't know, whenever I'm around, um, I don't not just, Jew, but there's a particular way, but it's structured to how like Jewish sort of mm. study and thought is, as you kind of like bounce around between multiple ideas, even like the structure of a page and how you study if you were to study, you know, religious yeah. text has the original and then it's surrounded by other opinions on the same page. So it's like, I feel so many ways, different people pick up on other things. I really appreciate you picking up the language part. I like, I like having different threads that people grab. Yeah, no, I think we, exactly what you said. It's like anything that challenges, you know, authoritarian structures need to be able to control everything and to control things you need to like categorize it and, um, document and dominate you know you need to and yeah I, I copy edit books for a living freelance and they're not always you know what I would necessarily read but um but I, I did one recently which really was provoking was a history of a about a hundred years ago of um a, a Jew who had died in Tunisia but um or had died he was Tunisian Jew he was born in Tunisia but had 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 lived in other places France um, Italy um etc and also was um pretty religiously jewish so had jewish law so the whole book was about the debate about like how do you decide what to do with this person's um um you know the, the leftover estate of this person and um the reason i bring that up is because it was like it was only 100 years ago and i was reminded i just finished that and i was reminded yet again like only 100 years ago most people didn't have passports um most people their names changed when they wanted them. You know, they had various different names. Mm-hmm. They moved between places when one place got, you know, dangerous or uncomfortable or for just, you know, because they felt like they wanted to or, you know, and belonging was something related to so many of the different things, including languages. And this book also talked about, you know, the kind of overlap because it mentioned Tunisia between Muslims and Jews and the different languages and the sort of ways people could speak to each other and, you know, sometimes good relations, sometimes not great, et cetera, but they were, they lived, you know, they lived in similar spaces. And, and, and then, you know, then we have the rise of like, you know, Tunisia gets colonized or other things happen and this imposit, and then we have moving up to, you know, Nazism, um, fascism and Nazism sweeping Europe and the globe and this profound imposition of, okay, we need forms of citizenship. We need documentation. We need to know who you are. We need to be able to control you. And language is part of that, right? The erasure of supposedly languages that are archaic or backward or peasant-like or unrefined, you know? And um, so much, you know, anti-Semitism was built into, even among Jews, right? <laughs> um, into crushing which languages um we're seen as more cultured or more, you know, progressive or all these other notions. Um, but also, you know, way beyond, um, you know, person to person kind of differences is it, you know, nation states need to have a sense of we are all one people. And to create that, they create artificial borders or flags or things like languages, right? And enforce those um, because of Otherwise, what is the nation? It is, it, it's, it's really nothing other than a set of Im- imposed, you know, structures of control. And um, I mean, you know, it's, it isn't just nothing. Obviously, it's a very violent. Um, and states in general are not, I am not a, a fan, opposed to, <laughs> I am opposed to states in general. So I think, yeah, I think, I think what to go to the beautiful parts of why, you know, what, what is subversive of, to states and other people that want to control is that people feel a sense of belonging. So you would know this better than I, because you've studied Yiddish far more than I have. Um, but, you know, it, it always pains me when people just go kind of, oh, you know, Europeans are the problem or everyone that speaks Yiddish is the same. 
such a flattening out of history, right? There's plenty of rebels, indigenous peoples, rebels, um, dissidents, heretics, um, struggles within Europe, right? It isn't a, a seamless place and different forces won out. Um, but Yiddish itself wasn't, right? <laughs> like, And so when people have different languages that change by how they travel or by regions as people can recognize different dialects or pick up on different words and communicate across languages or it it's so much more it's so much more incredible in terms of like it gives one a sense of belonging and a sense of place and a sense of home that hereness you were talking about that doi kite Mm -hmm. when um you know you're yiddish or you're ladino or all sorts of other variations of languages have within them both a sense of where a place (laughs) and a sense of your travels at the same time, right? A sense of what you brought into it. Um, There is no, none of us are pure people, right? You know, I mean, fascism, authoritarianism and fascism, it it works by essentializing identities, um, trying to create pure identities. And, you know, what to me, part of the political project as as both a Jew and an anarchist, a queer, (laughs) um, is is that none of us fit in those, in that, those pure identities where all these beautiful, incredible generative um, convergences of a whole bunch of different threads that we draw out to create forms of collective care and solidarity and mutual aid and reciprocity um, and consent. Right. And yeah. And the way to impose, you know, I don't know. I really even think about names a lot um, because I don't like my first name. I hate my first name, Cindy. And I keep playing with different names. It was a choice. My, parents made right after I was born, they were going to give me a, a, a Jewish sounding name. And then my dad especially was like, you know, from his own trauma, et cetera, was like concerned. Mm-hmm. I would be the, you know, I, I would be, I would face a lot of anti-Semitism if I had a name that sounded too Jewish. Although Milstein, I, yeah, <laughs> kept the name that was Jewish and also was proudly Jewish. So it was one of those kind of contradictions of, which I think a lot of people experience again from going through, you know, the trauma is different. Other people is you both are seeking security and safety and to protect each other. And you also want to be proud of who you are. And those two things are often in tension with each other. Right? And so how does language work? You know, and it, it, it took a name that I was going to get and gave me another one. And so I playing around with like, but then I look back in history and for most of history, people did not have one name. They had different names at different moments in their life when they cha- transitioned to something special in their life or some life change. They had affectionate names, you know, by different people in their life. They had different names that related to their relationship to different people that made it clear what their relationship was or, or maybe playfully unclear, you know, names yeah. of people the one they didn't like. But we were, we were not this, like, we were a full person who would, was understood differently by how language named us, depending on our social relationship with other people and spaces and places. And what a, what a horrible way to contain, you know, so you want to contain and control people is cut off their social relationships and force them to have a name, right. Which is on a passport and on this thing called citizenship, which is by and large, not been a friend <laughs> to most people. Um, right. It's, it's, I do not think, you know, I'm thinking a lot about this, the fight, you know, for, for black, I've been really influenced of late, reading uh, a lot by um, black anarchists of, that you know black people have never been considered part of um, citizenship or the state in in the so-called United States, and the fight should not be to be part of something that will never um, not be um, anti-black, but or, or racist in general, um, white supremacists in general, but to mm but to figure out other forms of social relationships, right? And part, partially that's through, through language, um, through reconnection and so many other ways, obviously, right? Um, but yeah, how we speak. Yeah. yeah. And, and feel free to interrupt me just randomly. I just think no, there's so okay. much, so many, no, there's just so many elements from the language. I just yeah, think is yeah. so, is so fascinating. I mean, I guess the last thing I'll say about Yiddish, which I, and I, I mean, there's so many, I, I, I wish I was better at languages. I would love to be learning. I, there's this huge, profound, um, relearn, trying to relearn languages within um, this sort of revised Jewish uh, Jewish anarchism, and including a lot of times when people create spaces for ritual or political organizing and stuff, um, this interest in bringing in multiple ways of saying things. <laughs> so uh, 
people have been doing a lot more. For instance, Hanukkah just happened a, a little recently, and there was so much more in a beautiful and playful and loving way of sharing. I think there's like 50, 60 different ways to say and spell Hanukkah. And so people were trying to name all those ways or bring a bunch of them in, you know, and I was like, wow, this is the first time I've seen such a beautiful, you know, you know, we're taking back this joy that here's some, a, a festival of, of light and resistance and a whole bunch of other uh, understandings of it that we're taking back and we're taking back all the different ways of saying it. Um, but for me with Yiddish, I, what, one thing I really appreciate is like the, the you, Jewish anarchists were hugely influential <laughs> to um, the beginnings of what is understood as anarchism, a big strain within that, and were long a big part of that. Um, some of the prominent names people think of when they think of anarchists are, are Jewish anarchists. And most of them, um, a lot of them used Yiddish, and especially those that um, emigrated to the United States or were in the United States for a while. And um, you know, the largest and longest lasting anarchist newspaper, it was um, Frey Arbeiter Stimmer, which is a Yiddish, um, Yiddish, Jewish Yiddish anarchist newspaper. Um, but there's such a, one reason people want to learn Yiddish is there's an enormous body of literature that's anarchist. <laughs> so for, for people in my world and radical and socialists and communists is all the Jewish radicals that were not all a good percentage of that was the language they wrote and spoke and organized and agitated in. And so that history, even to find that history again, one needs that language <laughs> so that history doesn't get lost. And that hi histories of resistance, you know, whether it's anarchist or other uh, histories from below of, of what I understand to be libertarian or anti-authoritarian histories of struggle and resistance um, are, have so many of them have, will be lost to history if we don't actually return to languages and be able to read them again, right? So many practices of self-governance, um, self-determination, self-organization, people spoke of them or sang of them, <laughs> or, you know, in, uh, there's a whole bunch of songs, again, people are reclaiming in Yiddish and other, other languages that Jews used. 150 or so years ago, there were anti-cop, right? <laughs> anti cop anti czar, anti this, anti that, right, of hierarchical structures. And so to come back to those languages, you come back to practices of resistance and practices of struggle that have a lot to say for the present. Yeah, what you were talking at, I, so yeah, I'm going to put some, some of those songs that I remember I was listening to while doing that, while, while doing that thesis, and there's a lot of them on YouTube. Uh, oh, great. The, both Ladino and, and, and Yiddish. So I'll put those in the description. Are there, are, are there, are Ladino uh, sort of anti-police songs? No, I think the ones I found were all like lullabies. And <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. beautiful. But like, I also thought of this uh, one example that I always give when I, when you, because you mentioned this whole, uh, like even European history isn't flat and it's actually more complicated and how it actually, I, I do genuinely believe that it benefits like the authoritarians and, you know, and I'm using a wide umbrella here, like uh, capitalists and, and the right wing and all of that stuff. It benefits them to sort of portray Europe as this m monolithic uh, entity. And one of the good examples of that is uh, the Dreyfus affair, which obviously is sort of infamous and, and many people already know about it. I'll just briefly say that this was the, you know, it's called the Dreyfus affair because Alfred Dreyfus, he was this, um, French officer of he was of Jewish origins and he was falsely accused of spying for the Germans and it was an entire thing it lasted for like years and years I think over a decade even and in the end he was acquitted because he hadn't been a spy he wasn't actually the spy it was someone else but the story so many people would know this element and they would of course think of anti-semitism which it was and that was a huge part of the story but another element of that story is that Dreyfus was from Alsace and Alsace is this is this region which is now in France, but which for like three hundred years changed hands from Germany, like from the Germans to the French, essentially the, the states. And that's why the main city is Strasbourg in French, which obviously sounds German, Strasbourg. You know, you might say it in German, but it was those things that you you have also as a sien as a language. But in the in the process of forming the respective states. Though a space like that one, which was sort of liminal, you might say, which was in between two giants, essentially two political giants, had its own language, but also many people who speak French and or German or both at the same time and so on. 
um, wasn't really allowed to exist as we know it, or as, as it would have known, if you want, if there wasn't this obsession to, you know, on the part of the German state where everyone has to speak German or on the part of the French state where, like, everyone has to, be, has to speak French. And so this was a... a the, the nation states were largely formed around, or at least those in Europe, but it's, it's a global story as well, where they were largely found around this concept of a language. Like, this is what we are. We're not French because we speak German. And that's basically the only definition of a German at the time. Oh. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And- no, it's really intense. I, 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 for <laughs> years ago, I lived in Ger- in Berlin for a couple of years. Um, yeah. Not, not happily. It was very difficult. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I was so struck by, it. I'm, I'm really not good at languages and, but I was trying to learn German the whole time and, and the intense a- antagonism, like nobody want, you know, like no, pretty much universally Germans would not want to converse with me because they would always go, your German isn't good. You know, it isn't our, ger-, you know, and I was just so struck by, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just touching on like this intense, like language isn't just language it's like this defining thing of who's in and who's out i mean it was a place too where every day it was i've never been it was so everyone understood me as jewish which was an odd experience i had never had before (laughs) and so i don't know it's just an intense thing where language yeah you're totally right and and it's really sad in a way i mean i i just feel like so much of even what is understood as europe was was multiple different regions which had vastly different self-identities you know senses of belonging and and um, things that people felt, yeah, proud of in a non-nationalistic, non-essentialist way, a little more liberatory way that, that's been destroyed, right? And I wish we would talk more about, I know you mentioned 1492, I, I use that date in, in the anthology, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's many other dates we could have, but that date has really struck me in particular. Um, and since then, I've read a little bit more about things like, you know, the papal state or the inquisition or things like that, how much, you know, that consolidation of catholicism including into a state <laughs> um, which exists to this day um destroyed millions and millions of people's lives and cultures um and i think we think of 149 you know columbus gets you know also gets flattened down to who, who that pivotal moment gets flattened down and i think it's intentional that it does in a way it's it's helpful for um colonizers and states and um you know authoritarians uh, etc to to flatten out the history um, because it was a moment when, um, you know, the rise of nation states and capitalism was targeting Jews and Muslims and indigenous people and black people and women and queers and uh, anyone that was seen as other to that project of consolidating, you know, what has become turned into a, again, sort of a, a, you know, a a white supremacist, uh, very Catholic or Christian, um, patriarchal and heteronormative, sorry to add a bunch of words on project, right? And, but that moment is like, it's this incredible intersection, that time period um, between massive amounts of witch hunts were happening, which were killing uh, women, queers, and also which a lot of the ways we understand what witches look like came from anti-Semitic tropes, which is a whole nother <laughs> tangent. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was very anti-Semitic time period. Um, there was the Inquisition, which was, uh, you know, it, compelling Jews and other and others, Muslims to either, you know, assimilate, die or, or leave. <laughs> you know, um, um, we Clearly, you know, the ships heading out to um, colonize different parts of the world and kill off indigenous peoples and the slave trade happening. And all those things are happening at a, at a really similar time period. And yeah, I stumbled across this, whether it's myth or truth, but uh, um, the, the last day of the, um, the last day that Jews had to decide whether to, you know, assimilate and abandon being Jewish or, you know, be displaced or, and or be killed um, was that day um, um, many Jews were decided to flee and the port was apparently so crowded in Spain that um, Columbus had to delay his voyage by a day. And that, that you know, whether whether that's, you know, I don't know, historically, I don't know, just, just even this idea of this, these ships, you know, that moment when all of us, yeah, we're so, we're so incredibly traumatized and hurt and killed and how many, you know, all the, all the, all that came out of that moment, um, 
to me, you know, in a a sense, like the saddest day for all of us. (laughs) Um, One of the saddest days for all of us also shows us that when we take back the story and say, hey, that's the narrative is there's a different narrative is that could be drawn from that is a lot was stolen from all of us. And what was stolen from all of us has, in a way, a lot of shared traditions and overlaps and connections that weren't about trying to consolidate states or capitalism or other things, right? Or colonies, like we weren't doing that to each other for thousands of years. Not that humans were ever perfect beings or we weren't hurting each other in ways, but there was definitely a major project that happened in 1492, which is had enormous consequences, right? Which we um, don't need to talk about here um, for the world. And what does it look like to go back and say, wow, how are we all impacted by colonization? What was stolen from us all? How are we all impacted by the genocides that happened then? And, and not just what was stolen, but what we want to steal back. <laughs> That's to me the more interesting question. You know, so for me, I want to, you know, steal back a sense of solidarity and communities without states and a word, world without um, nation state borders or essentialized identities. Um, you know, a world rich with, you know, rituals and traditions and cultures and, um, you know, crossings over that, that the beauty of um, the seeding we do for each other in the diasporic sense of scattering, scattering all sorts of different things where we share and things that's, you know, you know, that's just, that's a different story. So I think there's a lot of really good studies. Like you were just pointing out your work. I'm just noticing a lot of also people are doing more like on telling a different story of history, yeah. <laughs> you know, and history against the grain or history from below, but yeah, their story, I don't know, you know, again, to come back to languages, you can say, languages the power of languages is who gets to tell the story and in what way and i love storytelling when people are able to tell different stories because wow the damn narratives that we hear are so again hegemonic and flat and they're intended to make us think the world is a certain way to naturalize things that were never natural right is germany natural no right right but the origin stories that the narratives that get told not just to single out germany france we could take any place right any nation state um yeah and those those stories kill us you know when they become hegemonic and naturalized and we have to tell yeah and i it's also i think no you know not just written languages but the oral tradition has been stamped out and seen as not valid and that's how people carried on these traditions of telling other stories was orally too, right? And that in, the beauty of an oral tradition is it implies a social relationship. You have to have some connection to other people to tell those stories and to pass on those stories, right? Um, and yeah. it implies a fabric of communities and something that, um, so yeah, I, I really think reclaiming our ability to tell our stories and in all our different languages and voices and tongues and <laughs> traditions, <laughs> rituals and songs, yeah, is precisely a way, it, it is a tool against, um, to dismantle um, states, borders, capitalism, not the whole of it, but it's a, it's a pretty profound one, denaturalizing. Yeah. I mean, that's, may we look at the pandemic and it's pretty remarkable right now. A lot of us joked during the pandemic, the first, um, past, per, first Pesach that happened. If you're familiar with that holiday, we, re, we sort of mm-hmm. revisit that time of like wandering toward freedom and what that means. Mm-hmm. We talk about liberation a lot, liberation for whom and, we're supposed to invite the stranger in that's very prominent in Judaism, you know, and so we talk about like why we have solidarity for people who aren't us. And it's a very beautiful holiday to revisit it. But this year, you also revisit a time when um, Jews were trying to resist and they were, you know, for a bunch of things were thrown at them to help to just quell their resistance. And um, one of them was plagues. And so that the first year of the pandemic, I remember all of us reading it and both kind of crying and laughing and you know, going, wow, okay, we're in this other moment of a plague being thrown at us, you know, to destroy us. And, but so many, you know, the plague has, I don't want to minimize how it's brutal still, right? It's, it is a collective trauma and so many people have died and become ill and so many other ways people have, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a painful moment. And, but it also shattered a bunch of narratives, like you have to go to work <laughs> or you have to, you know, you can't, care for other you know you it, it's shattering those narratives and i don't i think we're just beginning to see how people are saying no my life has meaning you know i don't want to trade my life for capitalism i i don't know where it's going to go but it's a there's a profound shift going on where people are you know beginning to throw off the stories of what states and capitalism have told us they need to do to survive and are going hey you actually are 
trying to kill us. <laughs> you know? We need to look at different stories. And, you know, yeah. So I think there's this, I think there's, I think that's a reason also I've been watching a really big rise in, you know, not just Jewish anarchism, but indigenous anarchism and black anarchism and queer anarchism and brown anarchism. And I think it's because not because these things are somehow an add on to anarchism. And I just use anarchism because that's the world I, I care about and familiar with in a sense of like, I understand it's a tradition that says we can self govern and self determine and be whole. Um, but I, I think it's no accident because we're a lot of us are going back to all the things that were stolen from us and saying, Hey, within the black tradition, there's so much beauty that can, that's been about creating life. And within, you know, Muslim anarchists, there's so much beauty. It's been about life and do it. And, we're trying to reclaim those life-giving impulses. Um, yeah, and Judaism, are like one of the highest values, which actually it is often in tension with other values within Judaism is you're supposed to preserve life. And so there's all these different debates about, you know, sometimes that's in, you know, hey, you're, you're supposed to have a day of fasting, but if someone can't fast because they'll, you know, get really sick or die, you have to break that rule because life is more important, you know? And those, when we go back and look at those things, you can say, oh, okay, that's a religious thing. That's a kind of, maybe I'm not religious, but damn it. Like any, any, all of us now have to be in the service of life right? in whatever way we get there against this death machine. And we look at those traditions and say, yeah, what if we actually were constantly saying, huh, what, it, what is more important, you know, fasting for a day for a holiday or preserving someone's life? What is more important going to work in some crappy job or figuring out a way we can support each other materially and emotionally and not have people die because they need to figure out a way to feed themselves or house themselves. Their life is more important than some, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a really profound moment. And, and part of that's yeah. Denaturalizing stories. Yeah. And one of the, sto I mean, so yeah, the story of 1492, there's just so, so much happened that year. I won't dwell too much on it because you already said, uh, you already spoke about it. But uh, one thing that I do know, for example, of Christopher Columbus is that he supposedly was there. Um, I forgot what it was specifically, but there was a procession sometime after the fall of Granada, which was like the final victory for, for Ferdinand and Isabel. And he supposedly was there, like in the crowd, like, you know, celebrating. And, all wow. that. and we know that he was there or that he says he was there because he mentions that in a letter to the king uh, as part of the one of the, I forgot the details, but like one of the letters that he had sent to him telling him like, basically I need money to do this expedition of mine. And another thing that really struck me about 1492, and I would sort of ask you to talk a bit about, um, I believe it's pronounced Tisha B'Av, um, because you mentioned specifically that the remembering 1492, but before doing that, if that's okay, I would mention a, like a brief story of a language again uh, it's called well in english it's called mozarabic uh, which doesn't is, yeah in in arabic and in hebrew it would actually be called latin so just latin and this was a language a kind of a lingua franca in parts of the andalusian um in part of andalusia um, during the arabic period the Arab period and what's very interesting about that is that this is a language that was it's also an umbrella term because obviously the further you go back the less clear things get but this is a language that for example those who didn't speak it would refer to it as latinus as in latin they would actually refer to it as latin but it wasn't really latin it was just one of the descendants of latin and you can imagine this language in the same way as you have like spanish portuguese french and all of those other uh, latin languages descending from latin this is a language that could have also descended from Latin, but obviously it was, you might say, extinguished because this was a language that was part, you, you might kind of picture it as part Arabic, part Latin, a bit of Hebrew here and there and so on, though it's probably more complicated. I don't speak it, I just know a bit of the history. And what's very interesting related to our story is that this, calling it, uh, because the Arab, Arabs, when they would refer to this language, they would call it Latini, like they would refer to it as the Latin language. Um, and it's that, it's that name that would survive in Ladino. So it's this name that would, in the same way as Ladino ended up becoming, well, this is the language of the Jews specifically, but also others who were in uh, Spain and therefore speak a Latin language that is was called Ladino. And you have all of those threads essentially, which exist to this day, other than Ladino 
continuing to exist. The name, so it's not related directly, but the name also exists in another language called Ladin, which is still spoken today in the Alps of, of Italy. And you have all of those links. And th that language, the one of the Alps, is linked to one of the, mi the minority language of Switzerland, which is Romansh. And you have all of those threads all over the place. But if you have this very, um, I don't know, normative, let's say, I don't know which term to use, but this, I would describe it as a very boring understanding of the history of, <laughs> of Europe, it, it, those don't fit. This is more like, well, the Islamic period or the Arabic and Islamic period, it's kind of like this was a period and then uh, it was restored when it ended. That's, hence, in, in Spanish, it's called a reconquista rather than a conquista. So a reconquest rather than a conquest, which is what, tech, what it technically was. And so all of those threads for me just make it more interesting that if I think of Spain today and I have a bit of interest in Spanish history, it's very rare to have this understanding that Spain has this Islamic heritage and this Jewish heritage. You might hear a bit of lip service to it from time to time, but it's just not seen as as important as like if you if you picture something super Spanish, uh, other than Franco, which usually they don't, they don't want to think about it that way, it would be uh, you know um, uh, Don Quixote, for example, right? Uh, Cervantes and the whole medieval Christianity and everything that comes after it. But that's just part. It's it is part of the story. I'm not going to deny that. Obviously, it's an important and very interesting part of the story, but it's just not the only part of the story. And not recognizing that there is this other part of the story, the, the Arabic, the Islamic part of the story, is a way of flattening out those differences. And for me, one of the precursors of what would later come, like the, the, the obsession with flattening and with, um, yeah, erasing all of those differences. And there must be only one way of being Spanish, which obviously to this day is contested. You have, you know, Andalusian and Catalan and Basque and all of those other uh, identities coexisting or sometimes not so not so much with uh, the dominant Spanish identity for me it's one of the many precursors of what we and we would end up uh, identifying as fascism in the 20th century under obviously Franco but to to go back to 1492 can you sort of talk about what uh, this um, what what Tisha B'Av is and why did you in in the book why did you mention Tisha B'Av specifically of remembering uh, 1492 uh, and just quickly say, and the reason I'm asking is because it is, since we're talking about quote-unquote la reconquista, the expulsion, the ethnic cleansing, all of those terms, uh, it included, of course, Jews, but it was also of, of Muslims. So this is actually some, an Arabic speaker. So this is something that many people in the world today have in common, but it's not, it's very rarely if ever commemorated as a common event. Yeah, no, which it should, it should be commemorated as a common event. Um Jews, Jews, Muslims, Arabs, and it was also very uh, racialized at that time period too. How, how Jews, Arabs, and Muslims were understood in terms of uh, yeah, uh, yeah, racial, racial, yeah, components. Um, but yeah, no, um, yeah, I think it's another one of those um, historical sorrows or coincidences that um, Tish B'Av is a like, I mean, Jewish. There's like Jewish holidays pretty much constantly. <laughs> um, we have a lot of rituals and holidays, um, but I think in, in a beautiful way to make sense of the world continually. And um, there are several um, holidays uh, related to, they ask us to mourn and to think mm. about loss and grief. And yeah, I, I really appreciate it. But I'm sure this is true of every, you know, again, flattening out of holidays to be just buy things, you know, or something. But I mean, Jewish holiday space to me is like, you know, different times when you think about forgiveness or you think about, you know, community or you think about liberation. And they, a lot of them have themes that compel you to talk about and think about and reevaluate and every year continually. So Tish um, Bab is a major day of communal mourning, um, but it's the culmination of there's three weeks of mourning, grieving up to that, that day, especially the nine days right before it. And it culminates, it is considered one of the saddest days of the year uh, in a sense. So what, what, you know, you can do all sorts of rituals to think about intentionally think about loss and sorrow and grief and process it and, which I think is important, right? We need we need a language for grief too, right? Because um, I mean, I do a lot of sort of grief work, and um, to me, to my mind, we only grieve things we love, and so we have to hang on to and remember grief, grief, right? In, in Judaism, we often say, "May may someone's memory be a blessing," right? You, you want to memory is, yeah, even when it's painful, like that memory keeps some, that love alive, and mm. 
So on this, on Tishbab in 1492 was on that last day I was talking about when Jews were being expelled from Spain. So it just coincidentally fell on that, on that last day. I don't know whether that was something that, um, yeah, was known by the people who decided that was the last day or not. Um, but yeah, so it just, that, just a coincidence, but how, you know, this day ends up commemorating something that should not just be our sorrow, but as you said, a sorrow of so many other people. And I think grief is, again, another sort of way that we can share across um, our identities, none of which are, are stable or singular. Um, and in a sense, is like, I don't want that just to be a day of sort of Jews, you know, but I, I brought that in because I think, yeah, grief is, is really important and especially, um, you know, maybe again, to come back to this idea of sort of language. And I think one, another reason why, they're sort of uncovering all the differences that the ecosystems that people had in their, in their cultures in the world before it was flattened out. And we knew when you were speaking, talking about flattening out, I was thinking, what a weird irony. Cause you know, we go back to 1492 or that time period a little before it, when so many people thought the earth was flat. And then part of this sort of quote unquote linear prog, you know, linear trajectory toward progress and enlightenment um, was um, making the world round, but in a sense, you know, the, capitalism, patriarchy, the state, all those things have, you know, heteronormative, those things have flattened the world out, right? And before there was such an incredible ecosystem, a human ecosystem that mirrored the, the you know, the non-capitalist wealth of the ecosystems, that, you know, people lived in were foods, everything was so specific and beautiful to place and people, you know, had, real, yeah, but there I don't know, you know, part of why we're in ecological disaster, time of disaster is you flatten out the world, you flatten out the ecosystem, you think you can, you know, homogenize food and transport it around the world when people used to have such a deep connection. Um, and those connections meant that they had a lot of other connections across things in terms of grieving rituals um, or eating rituals. Or, you know, um, so for me, part of that uncovering of like going back to moments like 1492 and uncovering, wow, it's also bound up into this grief ritual. And for me, that's been a profound uncovering in terms of like moving back toward my Judaism through my anarchism <laughs> um, is to be, is to say, wow, anarchism doesn't give me the tools to get through the whole of life. But when I look at Judaism, I go, wow, there is a really intricate, intricate structure for handling loss and grief and profound from the moment, let's just say someone when dies it could be grief of all types but the moment someone dies you're not supposed to leave the body alone they're supposed to be surrounded by community you're supposed to be in community with other people for seven days um and in that community you know cry and laugh and scream at each other and argue cook do whatever you know do whatever you do but do it in community um you're supposed to you know there's rituals of of cleansing the body and saying helping talking to the body and sending it on its way with water but that also involve, has to involve a community of people doing that ritual um those grief rituals then end up you know being after that first week they go on the first month and then every other month and then once a year you know, for the whole of the time that people are alive to remember that grief and so yeah when we go back and say hey you know we come back to the flattening out of the world and you know how that has flattened out grief and loss too right now. Oh, someone dies. Okay. A few days later, you pay someone a bunch of money to, it's called a funeral home and they take care of it for you. You don't ever have to actually, you know, you know, have, have community or have any relationship to the person that, you know, you don't wrap the body. You don't do this. You don't do that. And then after a few days, the funeral is over and you go back to work and you forget about it. You're supposed to not keep grieving, get over it. <laughs> and, um, we need to remember, we need to remember, right? We need to remember that 1492, the sorrow of it. And we we need to remember the sorrow because we lost so much we loved <laughs> and we want to bring a lot of that back. And how do we do that? And so one of the ways I know you, like one of the ways I think in this book, for instance, on the cover and in, in, it's mentioned in the book a few times, but um, the person who designed the book is an incredibly beautiful human being and they designed books for me as labors of love, which is what I do, all the projects I do as to not for money, for, for love, which don't get paid. And, um, and they were not Jewish. And so they were struggling over what image. And then we thought, end up, I was like, Hey, let's try the pomegranate. And they came up with this 
really very luscious, sensuous, beautiful cover of a pomegranate sliced open where you can see all the seeds of the seeds of diaspora, but held together in this sort of hole. It both looks kind of like a heart and it looks like diaspora, the pain and the beauty, the sweetness, the tartness, the you know softness, the hardness, all the kind of dilemmas that are bound up in diaspora. But the pomegranate itself is, is another beautiful thing that was a lot of the whole Mediterranean or, you know, that region where, where pomegranates can be grown. It wasn't just a symbol. It was used by Jews a lot. (laughs) And so part of using it was to reclaim symbols that weren't like the star of David has become so statist oriented, for instance, and the star of David was, was actually picked up and popularized by the Nazis. And so (laughs) is that symbol necessarily right? Right. Is that what, what speaks to who we are and the, and mm. but so so there's a lot of sort of going back to different symbols you know it's a different like a symbolic language and the pomegranate's one of them and uh, I, I was in uh before the pandemic in uh, Hanya Greece and I don't know every time I've been in Greece which I feel like I have like a I have a relationship with as a human being and an anarchist and a person but I also have this bodily relationship every time I go there I'm just like I know I, f- I feel like I'm from here and so I really want to listen to that voice and there's a synagogue and a little teeny synagogue that was sort of rebuilt um, that's in Hanya on Crete. And uh, the last time I was there, I visited it and, you know, it's like barely used. It's hardly, I was the only one there. It was very, really tiny space and had been there for hundreds of years. I mean, all the Jews were killed you know, during fascism in Crete, despite the, the Greeks fighting so hard to protect them, you know, mm. harder than anyone else. <laughs> but every single Jew was ultimately killed in that city. Um, um, despite them trying so hard and um that little synagogue survives and I was just I was in there by myself this teeny little space that's been you know rebuilt and there's pomegranate images there's a whole bunch of different symbols symbols that aren't just what you would think of as like Ashkenazi Jewish or you know Eastern European Jewish there's symbols and that synagogue I read the little history of it, it was a meeting point for Jews from all across because Jews, you know, people travel. They've always, humans have traveled. They've always traveled. And so for hundreds of years, Jews came from all different places to that synagogue. And it was this great, and you look at the symbols and you're like, wow, this is every culture in this one space in the symbols. And there's the pomegranate, just long story short. Um, And, but the pomegranate isn't just a symbol for Jews, right? It's a symbol used by other, other other faiths, other cultures within that region and beyond because it grew there, right? because people ate it, used it in festivals and holidays, because it, it felt like it embodies and feels like and tastes like sort of the, you know, the bittersweetness, beauty of life. Right? You know? And so I don't know, you know, if we, if we flatten out the world, you know, pomegranates may go out of existence because they can't, you know, so many fruits and symbols are gone because they've been erased, but we also erase the profound history of symbols having meaning to people in regions and across space, across, you know, identities, et cetera. We didn't have borders, right? <laughs> way, you know, we didn't have borders now that impose and say, no, if you're Jewish, you have to put a star of David on the front. Why? <laughs> no, why? Why is that? You know, where does that come from? What is that speaking to? Nothing, right? It's speaking to something that was constructed often against us, right? How do we reclaim, yeah, even the symbolic language, which reconnects us to place and food and across, yeah, across, again, across cultures of so the Jews and Muslims just to take those two have had such a beautiful intertwined history for so much of the time period, which doesn't mean people didn't fight and argue and hurt each other. People do. Right. But there was a profoundly different ability to share and cross pollinate and, you know, et cetera, than the story that has been told, you know, contemporarily, um, which is, you know, so a long, a long winded, um, a long winded again, way (laughs) of getting, getting things. Um, Yeah. And I just want to, I want to, I guess, before I just want to touch on one other thing you had to tie this thing you had mentioned when you were kind of writing me about like the pomegranate symbol, which is why I brought it up, but you had mentioned like other symbols that we, and you'd, you'd happen to mention the forget me not flower as a symbol mm-hmm. of Armenian genocide. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know that when you sent me that ahead of time. And it, it just really felt really powerful to me when you said, wrote that in a way where I'm almost tearing up now um, on the second anniversary of the tree of life synagogue um, murders, anti-Semitic murders. Um, mm. I have a dear friend who, who was, who worked there with kids and was in Pittsburgh a couple days before it happened, et cetera. And then on the, came back to do a, a grief ritual the next year. And that, but on the second anniversary, I came back a second time to do another. And just my friend and I decided to do a grief ritual together. And we spent hours and hours in this beautiful wooded area doing all sorts of like, 
self. Yeah, my friend's really good at sort of making up queered versions of rituals. And we did a whole bunch, but one of which is my friend happened to bring forget me not seeds. And we did this beautiful ritual of like, end up, yeah, writing down our losses and grief and burning the paper in a little fire and digging around where it burned and burying the ashes along with the forget me not seeds. And a few months later, those seeds came up in flowers. And um, yeah, and I don't know why my friend picked forget me not. I hadn't even asked them, but I was just like, wow, you know, like maybe there's a way in which our bodies and our minds, I don't know, I believe more and more, like there's a way in which these things carry on, right? We, there's some memory of like, forget me nots aren't, yeah, yeah, maybe we were grieving the Armenian genocide too, and we didn't even know it at the time, right? (laughs) It was, yeah, this, so in a way where we come back to these beautiful different symbols that each other's used, we carry on each other's grief, even if we're not thoroughly consciously aware of it yeah i I, yeah i I tend to believe that as well and the forget me not flower is this beautiful beautiful flower which i i was in yerevan as it happened for the centennial of the of the genocide in armenia and that symbol was a bit everywhere and of course the other the other main symbol like you know there's this uh i don't know if you know it there's a very amazing movie um like from the Soviet era, it's like a Soviet Armenian movie called The Color of Pomegranate. And oh no, correct. Wow. Yeah, it's a beautiful, it's very weird film, like very art, um, like experimental, I mean, like, you know, that kind of movie. But the colors that, that I use are very vivid and just it's just a very stunning film. And uh, so, yeah, that's why like, when I saw the, the pomegranate on the cover of the book, uh, of course, I thought of this and... I did an episode uh, with Sophia Armen um, some a couple of months ago or something. Um, for those listening, that's episode seventy nine, in which the the cover of that of that episode is a forget me not flower with, uh, if I if I remember correctly, <laughs> I mean I designed it and I forgot, but like in the, in the back, there's a forget me not flower and in, in the background if I if I remember correctly there's a photo of her family in black and white from oh. uh, from towns that are now in modern day turkey obviously pre pre genocide and so those those symbolisms definitely run throughout all of this and uh like kind of like as a final point before we kind of get into the book section one thing that i remember i, I was uh, i re-listened to this interview that you did on the final straw podcast which i highly re- recommend to people listening i was myself a guest there with leila shami a couple of years ago uh, to talk about like Lebanon and Syria and stuff, and uh, I remember you mentioning this this concept of, like wrestling, right? Like wrestling with God, uh, wrestling with difficult topics, wrestling with uh, it's just no, this notion that instead of uh, I instead of saying the sentence I believe in God, it's more the sentence of I wrestle with the notion of a God like that. It's like it's always a, a give or take in some sense, and I was curious if you can sort of link that to like kind of difficult topics that you met you one of your chapters is anti-semitism hurts um and i read this and i saw a lot of uh, parallels to to friends of mine of course and as a quick parenthesis uh just because i forgot to mention it before uh i i did uh partake in a, in a pesach uh in 2020 2016 i think 2016 huh. it, in london it was in this small uh, synagogue and i think it was in east london and what was really beautiful about that moment is that uh, we we got to read a number of texts in different languages. And a friend at the time, Daniel, um, he his thing was languages. And so he, he was reading, and he speaks Yiddish, uh, and he teaches Yiddish, actually. And he was reading some of the texts in Yiddish and in Judeo-Arabic. He, sp- he read in those two languages. And someone else read in Ladino, uh, someone in English, and I myself read in Arabic. And it was just this, yeah, it was just a very, very precious moment that hasn't been, in my case at least, hasn't been reproduced at another time. Because soon after that time, the real, I would I describe it as like the realities of borders and visas and all of that kind of settled in again because I had to, you know, the visa expired and so I had to leave again and all of that. So I couldn't do it the year after. And so, yeah, I just want, if you can talk a bit about just the, this concept of wrestling with something as difficult as anti-Semitism, which is both sometimes very uh, visual or in the sense that like 
it's a word or it's an attitude or it's you know an accusation or it's whatever but of, more often than not it's even more insidious than that it's just like tropes that we've taken for granted like you mentioned the imagery of of witches for example and stuff like that stuff that we've taken for granted and i say we as mostly in the west because i live now in europe really taken for granted and and yet it despite the fact that we take it for granted and we might think it's harmless it, it really isn't and it has all of those insidious um effects yeah, yeah i'll just shut up now <laughs> can you can you talk yeah no, no, it's okay. it? <laughs> yeah yeah no thank you for bringing up the wrestling a friend of mine recently was telling me a story from uh torah it's, uh, jewish literature or whatever that uh you know the name we are god wrestling people because there's a story where like god comes to someone and wants them to do something and the person starts arguing with god <laughs> and then god changes their name <laughs> to, to the god wrestling people and he goes the moral of the story is whether you believe in god or not is we're really to even argue with god <laughs> you know? so i was like you know so there's this profound like anti-authoritarian straits it's, it's no accident that so many jews have become radicals right um because we're told to like argue even with you know argue with the authorities don't just take what they say (laughs) so that's so fundamental to judaism and but that also is the anti-semitic trope right the long long anti-semitic trope is jews are either like radicals the outside like that word the outside agitator phrase which often us in the u.s context uh, gets applied you know now to all Mm -hmm. sorts of other Mm -hmm. peoples often black people um the outside agitator i think first as far as i'm understanding it was applied to jews because um, they were not part of any nation states they they were all Mm -hmm. seen as having their own nation so this so on the one hand we're like the radicals the subversives trying to overthrow everything and on the other hand jews were also seen as the people behind the scenes controlling everything the capital right because jews you know historically for a variety of reasons had to you know couldn't never were able to really be part of the body politic or the economic world and had to do all sorts of sort of middle positions and you know like to be you know some jews did crap we all did crappy things right every i'm not trying to say jews are great (laughs) so anyway jews we all done crappy things but right fun but the stereotype that somehow jews are this shadowy people behind the scenes so those two things play out in so many different ways right and you know then they end up becoming like stereotypes i mean the witches thing you know that when you think look at witches now i can be i love i you know like witches so it's hard you know the stereotype witch with a big hook nose which is such a jewish stereotype that's where mm-hmm. that came, you know, came from or the hats were something jews were forced to wear to identify them those pointy black hats um, so some things get lost to history like that other things um you know just the tropes that play out again and again and again and so you know why is that why is it that there's why is it that you know anti-blackness plays out again and again or islamophobia or anti-muslim plays out again and again i think different things have different roles to play right and so it's it's helpful to those in power to have this group that you can blame you know oh we're not the ones doing it it's those people behind the scenes you know <laughs> and you know so we could flash forward to the present day you have things like you know QAnon in the in the u.s context or fascists where you know you know they often will one of the tropes that links anti-semitism to anti-blackness for instance is you know there'll be uprisings against gigantic beautiful uprisings against police in the united states really powerful two summers ago right calling into question the need for police and so many of the tropes became oh those you know there were you know outside agitators but it became really specific to the u.s context black people would not be rising up unless there was someone behind the scenes pulling the strings to help them figure out how to do that so it both was anti-semitic and anti-black at the same time right all to say is like anti-semitism hurts me it hurts a lot of people. It hurts people who aren't Jewish. And that's why we need to understand it as much as we need to understand any other similar logic that's both, you know, anti, I don't know, anti-Semitism is complex because it can be seen as, as you know, it's often bound up with a racial, racializing racism. It's often bound up with a, yeah, um, anti, yeah, sort of anti-capitalist, anti-capitalist. There's yeah, but it plays a role in terms of maintaining power, right? That's why it, it, it keeps going on. It buttresses fascism. Um, you know, why? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, it hurts It hurts on the level of, you know, right now for me, I just like everywhere I, everywhere I turn with, you know, images of what U.S. fascists are using in their language, you know, um, in their symbols, um, the January 6th Capitol thing almost a year or so ago when they were wearing Camp Auschwitz T-shirts, um, um, you know, they had symbols that would hurt a lot of people. Right? Um, 
again, racist symbols, anti-Black symbols, and anti-Semitic symbols. And yet what happens again and again and again, and this is where the hurt to me comes in and I was trying to get at is it's, it's in your face that they're talking about Jews too, or talking about anti-Semitism, and yet people don't even see it. And I, I, it's, and I think because so many people, it's so insidious, you know, I've had way too many people in anarchist and leftist circles, you know, somehow also think that Jews have a lot of power or take up too much room or, you know, have it, you know, have it good. So we don't need to, you know, worry about them. And meanwhile, anti-Semitism is like right in front of their face. <laughs> so yeah, it's a painful, you know, like for many people, it's a, it's a painful thing when other people don't see and acknowledge your hurt. And at this, yeah. I think at this moment, why it's been especially painful is like, there's this been real beautiful awakening of people saying, Hey, can't you see how anti indigeneity has hurt us? And a lot of people go, Whoa, I haven't, but yes, I I'm willing to now, or how, you know, how anti-immigrant has hurt us or how anti-blackness or anti, you know, Asian. And st- it's been profoundly anti-Semitism is still really resistant to having people see it or even name it or even support people when they're feeling their own traumas around it. Uh, you know, I was struck by that again, really recently, a week ago, a week and a half ago when, you know, on Shabbat um, in Texas, a person went into a synagogue and the reason they went there was because they thought Jews control things. And they thought if they went to a synagogue, the Jews could fix things for them. You know, really, it's insidious, right? really insidious how these things play out. It was thoroughly anti-Semitic, but the cops, the FBI, the media, um, non-Jewish friends of mine, I, you know, I didn't, I got support from Jewish anarchists. I did not, you know, it's who, 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 who thought to mention that it was completely an anti-Semitic moment, you know, and, and all the Jews, a lot of, you know, in my circles, we were also saying, oh, this is a really horrible moment because there's going to be a bunch of anti-Muslim and Islamophobia connected to it too. And we have to speak out about both. And I saw Jews doing that. And I saw Muslims doing that, but I did not see. Yeah. And so it's painful, you know, because it's not just painful because it hurts me personally or other Jews personally. It's painful because people get hurt and killed because of it. And because historically when we've been hurt and killed in the past, people have abandoned us. Right. And that trauma from the past resonates in the present, <laughs> um, you know, it, and so, yeah, I guess it's just a plea. Why I wrote that piece was to try to get across some of the same pain. It's like, I want to know your pain too, when it's directed toward you. And I want you to name and know mine because when the fascist, write down who they want to come and kill. They have all our names on it and we need to be there with each other, you know? So I just want to maybe end on this little, like, I know I'm ram, I could say so much about anti-Semitism, but that moment a week ago on Shabbat, I mean, it was so, I, it just, all of us who are my Jewish friends of us, we all have the same impulse when we hear those stories is we want to just run somewhere. I don't know where, you know, because we know there isn't any safety, but mostly we know we need to turn to each other to care for each other. And, but it's like a visceral fear and we have the same thing as like damn it we want to be able to be jewish and we want to be able to be jewish visibly and proudly and in liberatory ways and like for my jewish friends and i we create spaces in public parks and public places and we are visible you know bring our identities to public places we want to be able to do that and not have a fear of being murdered (laughs) and it it's it isn't just a false fear, right? It's like, you know, how do you balance? Like, how do we are in solidarity for each other so we could all be fully who we want to be? We can be those whole people and not have to, yeah, not have to fear. And ultimately in that story of a week ago, what I wanted to point out was the rabbi, you know, I don't, I don't know this person, right? I was just read stories about them. He had a deep interconnections in his community with the Muslim community. And they, I kept reading stories of him and the, and the Muslim faith-based community. And they were all like, we're family to each other. You know, we, um, there was such a beautiful interconnection. And when it happened and the hostage was happening, the Muslim community was so there for them as family. You know? And after it was what saved those hostages was the rabbi picked up a chair and threw it at the guy with the gun and got out and into safety. And I think it's like that story was getting lost too. It's like anti-Semitism portrays us as like, we don't have power to care for others. We don't have power to, to outside of ourselves, which we do. <laughs> and we don't have agency to care, to, to resist and take care of ourselves. We're not just victims, right? <laughs> We're able to take care of 
ourselves and each other. And that's always who has. We don't need police. We don't need states. We don't need, right? I don't care if the FBI tells, says it was an anti-Semitic attack or not. That isn't the point. The point is that it was so unacknowledged. Um, but I think the beautiful part of that story is like, it's this moment where it shows that people can take care of each other and we can figure out ways to get out of situations like that with our own forms of community self-defense, our own forms of solidarity and collective care. But damn it, we shouldn't have to have moments like that. You know, none of us should have to have moments like that. So yeah, it hurts. It hurts when people don't, aren't willing to name anti-Semitism like they name all the other, you know. And I know that happens a lot with um, anti-Muslim and Islamophobia and, mm. and anti-Asian. I think there's some, some, unfortunately, categories of hate and brutality and genocide that for some reason, just historically, yeah, don't don't get their due in, in this way. I, 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 language is failing me here. <laughs> Sorry. I understand what you mean. Yeah. It's... Yeah. It isn't just that it hurts. It kills when people don't, you know, because if we don't mm-hmm. notice it, we're like, who cares if fascists are targeting Jews again and again and again, you know, yeah. when they yeah. turn their gun, like we should care when they walk, go, we should care when they walk into a black church, when they walk into a, you know, a massage parlor, um, with staff by mostly Chinese people, or, you know, we should care when they walk into a mosque, we should care, we should, a synagogue. Those are all, we're all in this together, right? We know that. Again, it's that, the thing we've been talking about this whole time is like, they want us to think we have this like historical antagonisms toward each other, but it's the state and capital and fascism that is created and exacerbate and are the largest perpetrators of, the, of antagonism toward us. <laughs> mm-hmm. We need to find those, we need to all be together in this. Yeah. I I don't have I don't I don't want to say <laughs> I completely I completely agree of course um no it's so painful I just yeah I just can I, I don't know just aside it's just like January 6th it was like I, I like yeah. viscerally ran to the door and I was like I gotta get out of the and I was like I had this thing I thought not the fascist Nazis were gonna walk in you know and I, I in my mind I'm like this is not true this is not happening and I was like but there's you know like okay <laughs> you know it's it, it's yeah, 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 yeah. you know you get I mean whatever these we get traumatized by borders and fascism and it's not for no reason <laughs> you know our right. bodies we get to those places and we're like damn it you know so, but God it's so painful right now you know I can't even believe how Nazism seems to have been completely decoupled from its history of where Nazis were and who they were killing you know yeah. Roma Jews whoever there was a bunch of people Nazis were targeting but anti-Semitism with or without Jews was central <laughs> to Nazism yeah. you can't but now it's been like as if it's not even I just yeah being in the so-called united it's been mind-boggling to me like how can we speak about nazism and not talk about anti-semitism like that is core to its own, you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. core to its own self-understanding you know even yeah. if there weren't any jews once they got rid of all the jews they would still have been anti-semitic because it is a good story you know it's a good story for them to uphold not fascism anyway sorry i'll stop <laughs> No, no. Obviously, I completely agree. It's just painful. Yeah, I, I, yeah. It's just one of those things. I, I, I don't know. I kind of also words fail me. Basically, that's. Uh, yeah. Also, this episode with uh, Daniel Randall. Uh, I, I don't know a few months ago as well. And it was specifically on anti-Semitism on the left. Oh, um, I'll listen to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I mean, there is obviously anti-Semitism is mostly present on the far right. Obviously, and this where it's 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 kind of manifested, especially historically, as the worst thing, but still, it is, as I, as I mentioned before, like, it's this insidious thing that is often, like, there, there are, long story short, because, uh, you know, that episode was long enough as well, but it's, it's, there is such a thing as structurally, like, structural anti-Semitism, and it's something that, yep. like, there are philo- philosophers, like Moshe Poston, who's this person, like, he's a uh, Jewish guy. Oh, yeah, I know him. Philosoph- yeah, yeah, he died some years ago, uh, mentioning all of that, so anyway, like, I won't, I won't get into it too much, because, uh, yeah, because of that. But oh no, but it, it's it's. I mean, yeah. it, even when it's not like explicit anti-Semitism, I was part of the you know Occupy badly named Occupy movement in the United States, and mm-hmm. oh my God, the whole thing was structured around like there's a small group of financiers behind exactly. the scenes pulling exactly. the string. I was like, who are they talking about? The Jews, yes. you know? And then I was targeted at, at the Occupy. I was at as both a Jew and an anarchist. I'm like, okay you know, whatever. Did anyone get, like, my anarchist friends defended me, but I don't think anyone understood the anti-Semitic part of it. You know, for me, I was like, oh, that stupid phrase, the 1%, like, that became the Jews, a stand-in, you know. And unfortunately, a lot of the Occupy, you know, unfortunately, there were a lot of disaffected, like, white guys with guns at the Occupy I was at, 
who, you know, I tried to sympathize with and tried to be, you know, I mean, there was a huge amount of people, you know, occupy every type of person. They were part of the 99% supposedly, but I bet all of them are right now on the, you know, like white evangelical Christian sort of fascists. And, you know, you know, cause their whole thing was, you know, there's a small group, you know, whatever, we don't need to go, but mm. you know, their, their lives were being, instead of them saying, Hey, maybe white patriarchal supremacy and Christian are, aren't actually, maybe I should be humble and look at that, but no, instead, you know, I'm sure they've most of them moved toward fascism, you know. but because no one actually challenged that notion, you know? Yeah. So that's why it's important to understand anti-Semitism. Like if we'd actually been more aware of that, that movement could have politicized people in a different direction, you know, and, mm-hmm. and been much stronger than leading toward, I, it's not a direct line, but I think Occupy helped to lead toward this understanding that there's, uh, yeah, conspiracy theory thinking, which often is structured around the anti-Semitism too. Yeah, Dan- I just imagine Daniel said something along the lines of like, so the guest, um, like anti-Semi- the term anti-Semi- anti-Semitic conspiracy theory can be a tautology because it's a repetition. Like anti-Semitism wow. is, is a conspiracy theory. It functions on this model of a conspiracy theory. Yeah, he, he has an entire he has an entire book that came out on this topic uh, last year. Wow. If I'm mistaken. Oh, well, thanks. Um, I'll look at it. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, speaking of books. Okay, books. Uh, <laughs> what are, uh, yeah, what are the books that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, thanks for asking this question. I'm always bad, like, what are the three favorite? But I'll just, I'll say, um, I think uh, in the pandemic time period, I realized I was having such a reading. And then um, my dear friends at Firestorm Books, which also is the same town where um, the final straw is out of, there's a really incredibly beautiful anarchist ecosystem there, um, um, start recommending speculative fiction to me. And um, yeah, I think in this time period, it's so dystopic reading speculative fiction is a, a, a gentle, beautiful way. So I'll recommend three speculative fiction books. Um, one is The Unkindness of Ghosts by Rivers Solomon, um, who has many identities, one of which is Jewish, but I didn't know that at the time. But if you're interested in diaspora, it's, whoa, it brings together trauma and diaspora really profoundly. Um, another one is called The Four Profound Weeds, by R.B. Lemberg, which is another, which I found out after reading it, another diasporic, a Jew. So there's all themes of the diaspora in that too, as well, and trauma. And um, and the last one is Pet, P-E-T. And oh, I'm going to have such trouble pronouncing this name. Uh, Awaki Iemza, I think. Uh, E-M-E-Z-I is the last name. Mm-hmm. And I want to just say all three of these books, I mean, they're they're so beautiful, like grasping with like sort of politics, but light, light handedly. And um, they're queer. They're in, in the best of way, like troubling. Yeah. Beautiful border crossings, but all of them are absurdly beautiful in terms of the craft of their language and their use of words. And to come to our theme today, and they are just incredibly gorgeous pieces of literature and they have stories that you just cannot put down. <laughs> and while and they hold the complexity of what we've been talking about this whole time of trying to be whole and not forgetting that we're, we've got all these broken parts in us because when we forget, I mean, that's sort of, I won't give away what Pet talks about, but they, it's sort of in a, set in the beginnings of a world where people want to not tell their children that there were harms in the world beforehand as if you can shield people from the brokenness and it won't ever come back again. And so a little kid in it on this, in this book goes on a quest to understand what that brokenness might've been. Yeah. And comes to a much more holistic understanding at the end. So yeah, they all sort of tie into what we've been talking, but they're all just so pleasurable and help you build a world outside of this one. That's really hard right now to let our bodies have a little bit of rest. Cause you get caught up in the story and the beauty of language, but they also like, yeah, really speak to this moment right now and help us get through it better. It's amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll get all three of them. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, incre- they're actually are like, incredible. So, I like, I'm reading all the rest of the stuff by all three of them. They're all, all, yeah. incredible. all right. Well, uh, Cindy, thanks a lot for your time. This was really, really fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Oh, me too. It's such a, I, I really, I'm like when I, I was like, Oh my God, I wish we could sit down in person and talk. I feel like I'd love to spend hours with you talking now. Yeah. It's so, yeah. It's but anyway, maybe. damn borders and pandemics and someday, but hopefully someday I'll be in the same place at the same time. But yeah, I'm so, yeah, really appreciate. I just would love to talk to you more. I just really appreciate your, same here, your mind. And like, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, and who you are as a person that I'm getting to know. So thanks so much. I'm just, it's such a joy. I, I really mean that. I'm not just saying that. To you. <laughs>
<laughs> and, I don't uh, just say things to say them I'm, if you can. <laughs> so, but it was such a beautiful pleasure talking to you. Thank you.